Hello fellow cinephiles, 90s Film Guru here. Thanks for joining me today. Now, those who are new to the channel, my name's Sean, also 90s Film Guru, and I started this channel to have my say in particular movies and TV shows and a variety of other film content from the 90s. So, welcome. Today I'm looking at Shocker. This came out in 1989 and was directed by Wes Craven. This came out a few years after Nightmare on Elm Street, and it feels like Craven was trying to create something similar to Nightmare on Elm Street, but it came off as just being Nightmare on Elm Street again in a way. But I always liked and preferred when Wes Craven wrote films. Like, I, like don't get me wrong, Scream's fantastic, and there's a variety of other movies that he was involved in directing, but didn't write. But when he writes, there's something interesting, there's something about psychology and, and of, the, of a human being, and looking at the different aspects of what it means to be human, and also looking at dreams and the fantasy aspect to people's lives. And I think this film captures that, you know, again, in a lot of ways. It had a good cast with Peter Berg, um, Mitch Pilecki, Michael Murphy. This is definitely a very interesting film in the Wes Craven film catalogue. It starts off like you'd expect, you know, sort of especially late 80s, early 90s sort of slasher films in a way. You've got a killer who's killing these people that don't know who he is. There's an opening sequence where he's putting things together that remind me of Nightmare on Elm Street where Freddy's making a glove. And Horace Pinker, the killer's name is, he's really great. Mitch plays him so well and a very fascinating and engaging character. Remind me of Freddy Krueger in a lot, a lot of ways, but also sort of interesting, colourful serial killers that you would know from that particular era as well. And then after it's sort of the idea of what happened, ultimately something happens to Horace Pinker and that changes the film. Siskel and Ebert reviewed this film, it wasn't well received. Siskel gave it a thumbs up, he didn't mind it, he thought it was marginally entertaining and fun, where Ebert gave it a thumbs down. And he explained that he felt the film would have been a lot better if it had played with more rules. And I get what he means here. It's the idea that films like this have particular rules or set up, what, what they will do and what they won't do. And by keep adding to that, and not having those, it can lose perspective and, and lose itself and become a mess. And unfortunately, this film kind of does that. The first 40 minutes are really great and interesting, and it sets up interesting characters in, in the, the youth, and especially Peter Berg's character we've got to get behind, and his girlfriend, and the killer himself, and what's going on in the world. I think that's really interesting. But once, okay, Okay, this, film, this part's going to involve spoilers, so you haven't seen this film. I haven't seen this film go to this part of the video and continue on, but I want to go into a bit more about Horace Pinker and, and why it changes. So spoilers ahead. So ultimately, Horace Pinker is arrested with the help of Peter Berg's character and he's set to the electric chair. While he's in prison, he, he does something with a TV and I think that was the idea of, of his way of breaking free of his body. He's ultimately electrocuted in the chair, but his body starts, but his spirit starts to jump from body to body and body and continue on his murder spree, which I think is kind of interesting, kind of what um, Frighteners would do many years later. There's another reviewer, Stephen Holden, New York Times. He wrote, at first glance, or at least the first 40 minutes, Shocker seems like a potential winner. An almost unbearable, suspenseful, stylish and blood-drenched ride courtesy of writer-director Wes Craven. But after that first 40 minutes, it seems to lose its direction. Like, I get what Craven was going for, the ability that this creepy serial killer can jump from body to body and, and, and sort of continue on what he was doing. And I get what he was going for, but it sort of separates the film. It starts off like a normal sort of slasher horror film, um, putting in the fact that Peter Berg's character is having these particular dreams about the killer and only helps the cops to find him. The later part of the film goes into a real supernatural, psychotic, sort of uh, chaotic mess in a way. And it feels like Nightmare on Elm Street, you know, where the, the characters are um, tortured and tormented by the killer in their dreams. And this has that aspect, but it gets a little lost along its on the way. But there are good moments throughout, and it leads to uh, an interesting and somewhat satisfying ending. The film really focuses on Jonathan, played by Peter Berg's character, who starts to have visions, like I said, about the particular killer, 
Horace Pinker, and he's really the driving force behind them catching the killer because the police can't can't find who he is. And when Jonathan's um, adoptive family are murdered, he works with his father, Don Parker, played by Michael Murphy, have to reluctantly work together to only take down the killer, which they do. Like I mentioned, I think Mitch Pelleggi, I think that's how you say his name, he's fantastic as Horace Pinker. I think he's really great. He's over the top. He's really intense and violent and graphic and, and really there's a real intensity to him that you don't really see in a lot of Wes Craven characters and I kind of like that. He so kind of makes him scary in a way. He has this limp and this way of being. So when he hops to other bodies, they have the limp. There's one sequence that makes me laugh where he um, possesses a little girl. He's absolutely hilarious. The little girl does a fantastic job, very funny moments. And to see this little girl acting like this big, scary serial killer is fantastic to watch. Mitch is unhinged and crazy and I love that. And it's definitely a different role for what he's more known for, like X-Files and Supernatural. But he's still playing in that realm, and especially in one of the episodes of Supernatural where he pretends to be the yellow demon is really cool, and I can see how he was able to draw from what he did in this film to, to only put into that. And he's by far the best and most fascinating character to me in this film. Where I feel Peter Berg and Michael Murphy don't aren't the strongest aspects to the film, and their performances are a little lopsided, I guess, in a way, or a bit hard to gauge. Sometimes they're good and sometimes they're over the top and a bit manic and it just doesn't kind of work. While I, I don't mind Peter Berg as an actor, he definitely made his mark as a director and I've enjoyed a lot of the movies he's made. He's kind of really young here and I can see why Craven cast him. He is a good choice to play this young Jonathan who's a football player who's really been caught up in something and his connection to the killer is, is evident throughout the film. And I just think he does mostly a great job. I think Camilla Cooper, who plays Jonathan's girlfriend, Alison, is really cool. She feels like kind of like a Nancy Tina kind of character from Nightmare on Elm Street. She's very strong and, and independent and she knows what she wants. This is more spoilers, but she's ultimately killed in the film and that sort of loses um, her as his interesting character, but they bring her back in a fascinating way as more of a ghost sort of character that appears to Jonathan, more in his dreams, but also in reality. And she's kind of like this guiding light for him, trying to help him and direct him and to try and stop this kill of once and for all. This is really cool dream sequence where Jonathan's in sleep in bed he hears the shower going. He gets up to go and inspect and he pulls the shower curtain back and there's sort of like this forestry area behind the shower and there she is. There is Alison standing before him in a white dress covered in blood. I've always loved this imagery. I think that's a really interesting imagery. And he's fearful of her, but she's trying to help him. And I kind of like that. You can still see that she really cares for him even after death. But it does and definitely feel like, and critics have talked about, that Craven was trying, it felt like he was trying to start a new franchise. He was trying to start, take this new killer and do something different with him than he did with Freddy Krueger on Nightmare on Elm Street. Not that he wanted to be as successful with that character, but I think he wanted to create and craft something that was original and unique. And that's definitely what this film is, even if it gets a little lost and becomes quite wacky towards the end of the film. It is definitely trying to do something different, especially at that time, because no one had really seen Freddy Krueger or Nightmare on Elm Street type film before, so he really exploded on the scene with that, and he really struggled to do anything that, that got to that height until he did the first Scream in 1996. There are a lot of other sequences I like in the film where Peter Berg's character, Jonathan, first has the dreams about the killer, and he goes into this house and we see the killer and the killer can see him and it's sort of like he's seeing everything unfolding. I kind of liked that, I thought that was kind of cool. The opening, like I said, with the, the, the workshop where we get to see bits and pieces, much like Freddy Krueger, we get to see this killer doing what he does before we actually see what he looks like. There's another sequence where Allison's giving him this necklace as kind of protection in a way and thrown in the lake and it's about him going into the lake and she comes out of the lake kind of like, freaks him out a bit, but she comes out of the lake kind of like Lady in the Lake, handing 
the Excalibur to to King Arthur, and I kind of liked that aspect to it. it. Had a real myth and mythology. It wasn't as done effectively in this as it was in other films, but I kind of liked that aspect. It, it feels like there was a bit of myth around this film that Craven really wanted to inject into it. Subject matter in this film where he's dealing with the psychology of people and the idea of dreams and connection to bad things and bad people, he would do later in My Soul to Take. That film hasn't been well received. A lot of poor people call it a piece of garbage. I do recommend checking it out. It isn't fantastic or great, but it has some really fascinating and interesting ideas in it. And you can tell Craven was trying to was trying to go back to something he enjoyed making with, like he did with Nightmare on Elm Street and Shocker. He wanted to create and continue on developing and looking at this aspect of what it means to be a human being and the psychology of him. What I do love about this film is Wes Craven really swung for the fences. Like he was like, you know what, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to do what I want, how I want to do it. And like I said, the first 40 minutes is, is pretty solid and well done. It gets a little lost after that. But it's the ending where it goes really crazy that involves jumping from program and TV. Like there's a whole sequence at the end that... that really gets a bit ludicrous and silly and I think it loses its plot in a lot of ways. And f I felt that they could have went in a different direction with this, even though he's fun and entertaining. It just feels like a complete departure from the, the, what the film we saw earlier. There's another sequence I really like where Jonathan and his dad uh, ultimately find out where Pinker is and they go to his workshop. And this sequence is really good. It's just intense and interesting the way it's shot and put together. And the brutality and violence that unfolds in this sequence is really full on. It kind of like, if you look at Nightmare on Elm Street and the way that was done and the horror in that and the, and the practical effects and all that was solid, there's something really angry about this film. There's something really angry about the killer. And it's really intense. There's a lot of violence, a lot of blood, and it's a stylistic choice and decision made to create the character like that. But I've never seen a Wes Craven character so intense and crazy as, as Horace Pinker. He's just intense is the only word that comes to mind to describe him. And I was shocked by how intense this film really was because of that character and because of what he does in the film. So according to Craven, the film was severely cut for an R rating rather than X. Apparently it took around 13 submissions to the Motion Picture Association of America to get the film cut down. Some scenes were cut out, certain things involving Pinker and what he does to particular people. There's a more graphic electrocution sequence in the film that was meant to be in the film than what we got. And there's some sequences where when he possesses certain people they do really dark and terrible things and they cut sort of that. Despite the fan interest in a cut, uncut version of this film, it's never been released. I think this is a film that could be re-looked at as a, a potential re-release, um, as sort of, you know, like imprint or something like that, bringing the film back, have the two versions of the movie, the original, the, the version we've got, and also the uncut version and what that would look like. And it's also a film that, I guess in a way, even though I hate to say this because there's so many of them, a film that could be remade, a film that could be re-looked at and developed and changed into a really great and solid film. But in saying that, I wouldn't want to see this movie destroyed and destroying Wes Craven's legacy because it's such a unique film that really feels a lot like him and the story he wanted to tell. Even Craven himself talked about redoing it. I'll read what he sort of said. He said that, I'd like to redo Shocker just to get the special effects right because we had special effects disasters on the film. The guy who was doing all the visual effects kind of flamed out and a nervous breakdown and had, an, and had a nervous breakdown because he was attempting more than he could actually do. When he told us towards the end of the movie that not a single one of the effects was actually working, he was working on new, new technique. And they only pulled in favors from all over, all over the industry from what I read here. So I kind of would have liked to see a redo of this film or a recut, but obviously that will never happen due to the fact that Wes Craven is no longer with us. But I think this is a film that should be looked at and shouldn't be condemned and shouldn't be looked in his catalog going, oh, I would never do watch that film. It's definitely worth checking out, especially if you're a fan of Wes Craven. In the end, this is a very unique and interesting film created by 
one of the great horror directors in history and he really swings for the fences and tries to do something unique and different and at times it fails but overall it's a very interesting film to watch interesting is the best word i can come up with to describe it some of the i'm really it was really impressed with a lot of the effects even though he craven like i said felt that they weren't as good as they could have been there's just something really cool about the way they what they do with pinker towards the end of the movie and how he appears when he's ultimately dead i kind of really love that and i really wanted to know how they did that it has practical effects, visual effects, and it is just a really unique sort of slasher horror film that really gets lost in its own, uh, gets lost in the weight of itself, but is still very highly entertaining. And I would definitely recommend this. I'm going to give Shocker three and a half out of five. Very solid, unique, and interesting film made by one of the great horror directors of all time. That was trying something different that was trying to break free of other things he, he did and trying to get back to something that r was reminiscent of nightmare on elm street his sort of biggest hit and tell scream of course anyway that's all for me today thanks for watching i hope you enjoyed this video and if you did please hit subscribe down the bottom follow my letterbox and facebook otherwise until next time enjoy the movies